Good afternoon from Laos, ladies and gentlemen on site and online. Welcome all of you to Mekong Hepatitis Symposium 2022. And welcome our symposium president on site here at Crow Plaza Hotel, Laos. Dr. Sisawa Sutani Rasai, Deputy of uh, Department of Communicable DC Control. He is also Executive Director of Center of Infectiology, Lao Christophe Merrier, and Dr. Francois Xavier Babin, Director of International Operation Merrier Foundation. Now, may I invite Dr. Francois Xavier Babin to have a speech and welcome remark for our symposium today. Dear professor, dear doctor, dear participant, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today for this uh, Mekong Hepatitis Symposium, especially since uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, iterations that were uh, made uh, online. So I'm very happy to, to be here. As you know, uh, Fondation Merieu that I represent uh, is a, a sponsor among many others of this uh, event. Hepatitis uh, are very important, viral hepatitis. It's a major public health problem in the region. And the objective of this symposium is to move forward the practices to, to try to help you among all your different disciplines to improve your work and to participate to the global objectives of the viral elimination by 2030. I would like to thank all the participants, all the speakers, and all uh, the people that uh, prepared this event. This is uh, a lot of work. And so uh, I would like to, to thank you them very warmly uh, for this work, which is very important. I would like to, to thank so all the participants that came from the region. I already saw some people uh, from uh, Thailand, from Cambodia and uh, I guess from many other uh, places. Um, and also all the participants that are following the, this event online. So I think this is one of the benefits, if we can say so, of the COVID-19 and so the ability that now we have uh, to have this kind of event both uh, inside and online. So I uh, won't be too long. And uh, again, thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Francois Xavier Babin. Next, may I invite Dr. Sisawa Sutani Rasai, Deputy Director of Department Center for, Infection, for Disease Control and Executive Director of Center of Infectiology, Lao Christophe Merrier, to have an opening remark. Dr. Sisawa, please. Thank you, dear Dr. Xavier, Francois Xavier Babin. Director of International Operation, Mary Foundation. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Very good morning, some country, and good afternoon to all participants and to the, to the speaker in the room and online. On behalf of the CILM, it is a great honor for me to attend this very important meeting. First of all, I would like to take, to express our sincere thanks to all of you to participate the Mekong Hepatitis Symposium 2022. We all know that we need to eliminate the threat of uh, viral hepatitis by 2030. This can decrease suffering and a uh, whose burden on the healthcare system. The question is, how can we reach this ambitious goals? The answer is that we need to use the right methods, tools, and drugs that we already have. This is why we have this meeting. The goal of this meeting has 
no change over the, the, the year. The CCN has always been to help clinicians and the practice to diagnosis, evaluate, treat, and follow patient with viral. This year, for Lao and international participants, we will have only a uh, two online and in person. Our meeting this year, we expect at least one seventy from more than ten countries around the world. During, during the next two hours. We will discuss the following topics. The first, the goal and the resonance situation on viral hepatitis. Second, maker for diagnosis and monitoring treatment and prevention of hepatitis B virus, including model to shy transmission. The third one, a result of scientific research on hepatitis and B and C in Southeast Asia. And the last one, challenges, opportunity and experience gain in order to achieve the goal of eradicating hepatitis C by 2030. Once again, I would like to wish you all a good health and success in your work. Now I would like to declare this meeting hepatitis 2022 symposium open now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. C. Savat Sustan Nirasai for your very nice speech. Now our symposium is officially opened. We can start our first session for this afternoon. Next, may I invite Dr. Francois Xavier Babin, uh, Babin, sorry, uh, to be a chair for the introduction session on hepatitis overview in Southeast Asia and session number one, update and prospective on hepatitis B care and prevention. Dr. Francois Xavier Babin, please. Thank you very much. So we will start this session with a movie that is called Draw My Life uh, on Viral Hepatitis. So. The liver is one of the body's principal organs. In fact, the liver is essential for life due to its role. It acts as a filter for the blood. It is involved in the synthesis of the main plasma proteins. It is the main energetic reservoir. We cannot live without a liver. In Greek mythology, Prometheus stole the god's fire. As a punishment, he was condemned to have his own liver eaten every day by an eagle. In response to an aggression, the liver is an organ that can reconstitute itself thanks to a process called regeneration. An acute inflammation of the liver, or acute hepatitis, can lead to recovery, death in the case of fulminant hepatitis, and in a third more common case to chronic hepatitis. During the chronic process of cell regeneration, a mechanism called fibrogenesis might occur, leading to liver damage that causes cirrhosis and eventually cancer. 
Today, five major viruses are associated with viral hepatitis. A, B, C, D and E. Two of them, HAV and HEV, are associated only with acute hepatitis. Three of them, HBV, HBV plus HDV and HCV, in addition to acute hepatitis, can lead to chronic infection. The hepatitis viruses can be transmitted by different routes depending on the virus. Both the hepatitis A virus and the hepatitis E virus, which are resistant viruses in the environment, can be transmitted by hydric contamination or through the fecal oral route. In contrast, HBV, HCV and HDV will be transmitted parenterally, such as blood contamination for B, C and D and sexual transmission for B and D. A specific HBV transmission of the disease is the mother to neonate transmission route. The hepatitis A virus is responsible for acute benign hepatitis in 1.4 million cases per year, which never go to chronicity and most clinical forms remain asymptomatic. Vaccination is efficient and useful for travelers. The HEV burden is estimated at 20 million individuals per year. It is an acute hepatitis, sometimes severe, especially in pregnant women during the third trimester of pregnancy, leading to fulminant hepatitis and death. A vaccine against HEV has only been approved in China. Globally, approximately 257 million people have a chronic infection due to hepatitis B. Mostly in certain areas, Asia, West Pacific countries, Sub-Saharan Africa and certain specific countries such as Mongolia. There are approximately 800,000 deaths due to HBV per year, every year. The chronicity is linked to the persistence of the viral genome in the liver cells. A therapy by inhibition of viral replication is efficient but cannot eradicate this persistent viral DNA that may also be integrated in the host genome. Therefore, there is a lasting risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. A very efficient vaccination schedule may eradicate the transmission of B and B plus D. It is part of the WHO hepatitis eradication goal for 2030. HDV is a satellite infection for hepatitis B infected patients in humans. 15 to 20 million people are infected. It's an uneven epidemiological infection rate with prevalence of over 20% in some countries, Central Asia, Africa. It's the most severe form of chronic hepatitis, increasing the rate of development of liver cirrhosis and cancer, and also fulminant hepatitis. There is no efficient therapy. The HBV vaccine protects a person from HDV co or super infection. Globally, approximately 71 million people are infected by HCV. This infection is chronic in a huge number of cases, over 50 to 80 percent. It may represent a high proportion of individuals at risk of liver cancer in some countries, such as Egypt. During the last 30 years, strong progress has been made with an antiviral therapy. Nobel Prize for Harvey Alter, Michael Houghton and Charles Rice. And a high efficient healing rate is now obtained with viral eradication in nearly 100% of patients treated for eight to 12 weeks. The main problem is that only 10% of people are treated due to a lack of viral infection screening and access to treatment. Cost, availability, it is part of the WHO Hepatitis Eradication Goal for 2030. During the next decade, the goal of the World Health Organization is to help countries eradicate hepatitis C and to control hepatitis B infections. This will become feasible by knowing the latest viral hepatitis therapeutic approaches, providing access to diagnosis and therapeutics to everybody, high technicity reference laboratories combined with point of care screening tools and drug accessibility will help such goals. Limiting the cost by using generics, 
continuously promoting vaccination programs for the virus when relevant, hepatitis A, B and D. In the next decade, hepatitis could hopefully follow the path of variola. So I hope that you enjoyed this um, excellent movie. Uh, I wish that we had this kind of tool when I was a student because it makes things much easier to, to understand. So we are going to, to start with our first uh, speaker. We are honored to welcome Dr. Kiyo Iko Izumi, who is a specialist in public health, technical officer at WHO Western Pacific Region Office in Manila in the Philippines working on HIV, hepatitis, and sexually transmitted infections. Dr. Izumi has been trained in public health at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana in the USA. He earned a PhD in Nagasaki University, Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences in Japan. He has gained a rich experience in various international contexts, including South America, Africa, and Asia Pacific. Importantly, he used to work in AOPDR in 2019 and 2020, and more recently at the beginning of 2022. He has authored or co-authored several research papers and communicated in many international conferences. And uh, Dr. Izumi is going to uh, speak about the global and regional updates towards the elimination of hepatitis. So Dr. Izumi, please. Thank you so much for your kind uh, in introduction. Um, so um, let me share my screen. Um, okay, um, so thank you so much for your kind introduction and thanks for inviting me to the Mekon Hepatitis Symposium 2022. It is a great honor to join today's discussion. So I'm going to talk about the global and regional updates um, by the hepatitis elimination by 2030. Um, I will update you about some of the um, epidemiology and uh, statistics and also the global and regional uh, key strategies. So I will start with the overview of the situation of viral hepatitis in the world and our region. So um, this is the uh, um, trend of the number of deaths due to three major infectious diseases in the world, um, tuberculosis, HIV, and malaria. So because, because of, yeah, yes? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we don't see your slides at the moment. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't know if it's a problem on your side or here in the room. We, we saw it, it was working. And okay. then you clicked on something and we, we see you, but we don't see us. Okay. Yes, it's back. Can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. How about this? Perfect. Perfect. Thank oh, you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So yes, um, um, so this is a trend of the death of the three major infectious diseases in the world. Uh, because of the extensive efforts and investments on these diseases, their mortality have been decreased globally. 
So however, viral hepatitis related deaths, including acute hepatitis, uh, cirrhosis, and chronic liver diseases and liver cancer due to the hepatitis B and C has been gradually increasing and has become one of the leading cause of the deaths in the world. Particularly in the Western Pacific region, estimated number of deaths due to viral hepatitis exceeded over three other diseases. The Western Pacific region still has a high burden of viral hepatitis. Um, if you see the number of infected uh, people of the 354 million people living with the hepatitis B or C globally, 35% live in the Western Pacific region in 2019. Regarding the number of deaths due to hepatitis B or C, of the 1.1 uh, million deaths globally, 49% of deaths were attributed to the Western Pacific region in 2019. So this is the top five high burden countries for the hepatitis B in the Western Pacific region. China is the, has the largest number uh, of the um, cases with the 86 million cases followed by Philippines, Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. For hepatitis C, similarly, China is the highest burden country in the region, followed by uh, Vietnam, Japan, Philippines, and Malaysia. Um, hepatitis B and C virus are causing acute and the chronic infection, infections that can lead to the liver cirrhosis and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So it represents approximately 90% of all primary liver cancer cases. And liver cancer is the uh, second leading cause of the cancer-related death worldwide. So Western Pacific region has the uh, highest burden of liver cancer globally with 530,000 new cases in 2020, accounting for 60% of new cases of the liver cancer globally. Similarly, estimated liver cancer deaths in Western Pacific region is 490,000, uh, which is accounting for also 60% of the liver cancer deaths worldwide. However, uh, we had uh, progress over the last several years. So prevention and treatment are core of the uh, he hepatitis response. Hepatitis B burst dose vaccination and free dose vaccination is the key strategy for prevention. Um, this is uh, because if exposure to the virus during birth, uh, newborn have up to 90% risk of acquiring a chronic um, HBB infection. So three dose hepatitis B vaccination coverage have been increasing over time and 83% of the coverage in 2020 globally. Um, you can see the blue line, which is a Western Pacific Division coverage. Um, this indicates over 90% of the coverage in the last uh, decades. Hep B birth dose coverage was 42% in 2020 global average, but there are um, uh, huge regional validations. So Western Pacific region has around 80% of the coverage, which is, which is uh, higher than other regions. So there was an estimated regional hepatitis B surface antigen prevalence of more than 7% among children aged five years in uh, uh, 1990 or pre-vaccination era, uh, strengthening um, the national immunization programs then led to the uh, achievement of regional targets to decrease HVB prevalence among children aged five years to less than 1%. So this is a, a great achievement uh, to meet the target of the 2020. 
Now uh, let's look at the um, progress in uh, our region against the global target uh, in terms of the service coverage by 2030. So you can see the uh, green bar, which is a global value, and blue bar is uh, uh, our region um, value, and the gray bar is the uh, global target by 2030. But that's the birth dose was 86%. And uh, three dose coverage was 95% against 90% of the global target by 2030. So uh, this is a really good job. Um, however, hepatitis B diagnosis coverage and treatment coverage are still very low at the 23% and the 15% respectively. So you can see the uh, huge gap against the um, global target by 2030. For um, uh, hepatitis C, um, diagnosis coverage and treatment coverage are also very low. Um, there is needs to strengthen diagnosis and treatment services and its reporting system as well, uh, so that we can capture those who are diagnosed and on treatment. But still, you can see the uh, huge gap still uh, exists against the uh, global target by 2030. So how we can achieve those uh, ambitious targets? Um, we have a global and also the regional strategy to achieve those goals to, toward the elimination. So I would like to introduce some of the key strategies. Uh, in uh, 28th October this year, uh, there was uh, the, the WHO Western Pacific Regional Committee meeting in the uh, um, uh, Western Pacific Regional Office in Manila. In that meeting, reaching the unleashed regional framework was endorsed. So this is a regional framework to deal with the remaining issues of infectious diseases and also maternal and child health, including the uh, communicable disease such as uh, viral hepatitis, tuberculosis, HIV, malaria, and so on. So it has a vision, which is that the um, transformed healthcare delivery and the public health systems across the Western Pacific region that routinely reach everyone everywhere and ensure equitable health outcomes. This um, regional framework consists of the five key action domains. First, demonstrate political commitment to reducing inequities in healthcare and the health outcomes. Number two, collaborate with multiple stakeholders across and beyond health sectors and progressively strengthening data and evidence systems and transform health system into integrated high quality and people-centered systems. And lastly, maintain cap capability for special uh, approaches, which includes the light, last mile disease elimination efforts and approach. So um, this regional framework is kind of overarching framework. Uh, this is not the disease specific, but the um, covering all um, communicable disease agenda in our region. But we also have a disease specific WHO strategy. Um, here are the HIV viral hepatitis SDI's strat global strategy from 2016 to 2021. Um, these global strategies were separately developed for uh, HIV hepatitis and SDI's. However, HIV viral hepatitis and sexually transmitted infections or SDI's share uh, mode of the transmission affected populations and common interventions. So they also share similar so soci social and structural determinants. Therefore, an integrated approach for these diseases is effective to deliver people-centered services. Um, so this year, WHO developed the Global um, Health Sector Strategy 2022 to 2030. Now the new Global Health Sector Strategy integrated HIV viral hepatitis and, and SDI's components under one strategy. So it aims for strategic shifting 
to the integrated people-centered approach by harmonizing service deliveries uh, along with the continuum of care for all these diseases. Um, so this is the um, uh, table of the contents in this uh, the strategy. Most of the chapters are cross-cutting for all these diseases. And also there are disease-specific chapters as well. And global health success strategy has shared um, impact indicators and also targets of all diseases. And also disease-specific indicators and targets for impact, service coverage, and milestones for 2025 and 2030. So let's look at the uh, hepatitis key impact indicator. So um, this is the hepatitis B um, key indicator. Uh, you can see the, uh, the number of the uh, hepatitis B infection and death in 2020 as a baseline. And our um, elimination goal is in the 2030. Our targets is the we will reduce that by the hepatitis infection to um, 170,000 infection in 2030 and 310,000 deaths uh, by 2030. And similarly, uh, we also have a hepatitis C um, indicator and the targets. Um, similarly, new infection and the deaths are the indicator. Uh, we uh, we are aiming to achieve the 330,000 infections by 2030 and 140,000 deaths by 2030. So these are not the regional um, target, but the global target. And global strategy highlights five strategic directions across all diseases to scale up services and achieving the 2025 and 2030 targets. First, uh, deliver high quality services and evidence-based guidelines to accelerate the uptake of the continuum of essential services. Second, take a, a systems-oriented approach that promotes synergies with primary health care, health governance, financing, workforce, commodities, and service delivery, also fostering multi-sectoral partnership. And third, generate and use evidence and data to monitor and evaluate progress and the guide actions. And engage empowered communities and civil society, including affected populations, and support their role in advocacy, service delivery, and policy making, and to address stigma and discriminations. The last three foster innovation for impact. So this guideline also um, um, uh, illustrate the uh, 105 concrete actions for shared action, HIV specific action, and by hepatitis specific action and SDIs actions. Um, so in our region, uh, we also have a um, regional framework for the EMTCT. Um, probably you may uh, know about this document as we published in 2018 but this document varied until 2030. The regional framework emphasized the importance of integrated and coordinated EMTCT interventions provided on the common uh, reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health um, uh, services platform followed, uh, following a human rights-based approach. Also, the uh, framework presents an approach to introducing additional interventions for preventing mother-to-child transmission of HVB infection. So this builds upon high coverage of newborn and infants um, hepatitis B vaccination programs. So um, as I explains here, here is the global health se sector strategy and the regional EMTCT strategies. So those are the kind of technical strategy. And also we have an overarching um, regional strategy for the communicable disease, which kind of the guiding principle. So WHO supports the member states based on our technical strategies and uh, translates them through the reaching the unleashed framework 
to adapt the global and regional technical strategies to the national strategies. So um, I also would like to introduce some of the updated guideline 2020. I do not uh, have a time to uh, um, talk detail, but uh, we have a series of new guidelines like a guidance for validation of EMTCT and uh, consolidated key population guidelines for um, HIV viral hepatitis and SDI and uh, simplified hepatitis C testing policy brief. So um, these are already published in the website. Okay, so I stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Izumi, for this excellent uh, overview. So we know exactly where we are. There was a very good progress on the vaccination, but still uh, there's a lot of emphasis to put on the diagnostics and treatment for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And also very clear with the new integrated strategy with HIV and STIs. So now we know what we have to do. We have to see how to do it. And so we are going to continue with the next uh, presentation, which will be on viral diagnosis uh, from classical to new biomarkers to monitor HBV and HDV infections. And the speaker is Caroline Schultes, Dr. Schultes, who is a clinical virologist at the Institute of Infectious Agents at the uh, Lyon Teaching Hospital, an associate professor of medicine at Lyon University since uh, 2012. Uh, Dr. Schultes is involved in several research projects aiming at improving viral hepatitis diagnosis and follow-up within the team of hepatitis virus and pathology of chronic liver disease at the INSUM unit at the Center of Cancerology of Lyon. So Caroline, the floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me well? Yes, perfectly. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the kind introduction and thanks uh, to the Fondation Mario and the Scientific Committee for giving me the opportunity to present a viral diagnosis from clinical to new biomarkers to monitor HPV and HDV infections. Um, can't go next. Okay. Uh, so as you well know, uh, viral uh, all hepatitis share common symptoms. And so you will need the biological markers to determine the etiology. Furthermore, it is often asymptomatic during many years, but you still want to diagnose it before the onset of severe same symptoms. So still, you don't want to carry on multiple invasive liver biopsy to follow your patients. Hopefully for HPV and HDV, we have a lot of circulating biomarkers that help you monitor uh, the patients. So we are gonna go through these markers. HPV and HDV uh, viruses share the same envelope protein. Uh, and it is HPS antigen, which are provided by HPV. So in every HPS positive patient, you also want to diagnose HPV, HDV co-infection by searching for HDV antibodies, because HDV co-infection can be found in five to 20% of HDV infected, HPV infected patient and leads to more severe disease. So to diagnose HDV infection, I told you that you have to search for HDV antibodies to search for infection. And after that, you have to look for HDV RNA that is a marker of viral replication and uh, is a marker of active infection. So HDV viral loads are often elevated while HPV viral loads are low and they may be negative and positive again after several months. So you want to repeat HDV viral load. And you have to be aware that currently tests are not well standardized and some do not quantify accurately all genotypes. So be careful. Now to go back uh, to the biomarkers, usually they are searched through blood vein puncture and uh, the samples are sent to 
specific, specialized um, uh, medical centers. But now, uh, especially for HPS antigen, you can use um, rapid point of care tests and they are very well uh, developed for HPS antigen. You can also use dried blood spots uh, also to detect HPV DNA. I'm gonna go through that later on. So HPS rapid diagnostic tests are now very, have now a very good specificity and clinical sensitivity compared to the classic uh, reference immunoassays. As you can see, all of them uh, have a sensitivity above 98% and also a specificity above 80, 98%. And they only use less than 100 microliters of whole blood and you can have the result in less than 30 minutes. So two of these uh, samples are now pre-qualified by WHO. Now, the specificity of HPV infection, it, that it leads to a stable and persistent infections through the persistence of the genome in the liver uh, as a, the CCC DNA. So this is the stable form of HPV. And what you should know is that every patient that has been in contact with HPV and the marker of that is the HBC antibody can reactivate HPV infection upon immunosuppressive treatment. And this reactivation uh, can lead to very severe flares and is really relatively frequent. So you also have to detect HBC antibodies. So now for chronic infected patients, uh, the CCC DNA leads to the transcription of several mRNAs that uh, leads to the production of several proteins. And you can find some of these proteins circulating in the bloodstream of the patients and also antibodies generated against this protein uh, through the immune response. But also from the CCC DNA, uh, yes, HBS antigen, sorry, can also be generated through integrated HPV RNA. And this HBS antigen is the only thing that HDV uses from HPV. So you can have HDV infection only if there's HPS particles generated. That's important to know. Now, from the CCC DNA only, you can also have transcription of the so-called pregenomic RNA, which is reverse transcribed into DNA and then form viral particles, infection variants that can also be found in the bloodstream. So all these uh, classic uh, markers are used to categorize uh, chronic hepatitis patient. And it is important to accurately categorize the patients because the following markers that I will show you later on have different uh, uses and different interpretation according to the phase of the disease. So, you can quantify HBV DNA through PCR, and it's called the viral load, and also HBS antigen. And this represents both vi complete variants and also subviral particles. And throughout uh, treatment, HBS will very, very slowly decline. So it's not a good marker for HPV cure. Now, when you use uh, nucleoside analogs, you will block uh, reverse transcription and the polymerase and thus eliminate uh, variants from the bloodstream. So you will have undetectable viral load, but still, HPS can be, pro be produced from CCC DNA and also from integrated DNA. So that's why you can have undetectable viral load, but still HPS antigen present. And for now, the treatments are lifelong treatment. 
but you would like to identify patients where you could stop the treatment. And also we would like to eliminate CCCDNA to really cure the patients. So that's uh, the task of the new treatment that are developed and the new biological markers. So you'd like to achieve partial cure, but currently uh, the majority of patients that uh, stopped new treatment will reactivate with severe flares. But some patients can be cured if they stop treatment and we'll need new biomarkers to identify whose patients can stop treatment without uh, risking a severe reactivation. And with the new molecules develop, we target a complete cure, that is elimination of the CCCDNA, or at least uh, to have CCCDNA transcriptionally inactive. So uh, to uh, evaluate the quantity or the acti transcriptionally activity, of the CCC DNA, we now have several new biomarkers. So still quantification of HPS antigen, and we also have new tests that uh, are more sensitive than the current test to detect HPS with lower value up to 10 to 100 times lower. And we also have the correlated antigen. I will uh, talk about it later circulating HPV RNAs, because as I showed you before, there's a step in the viral life cycle with HPV RNA, and this RNA can go out through different uh, kind of particles. And now we also have new biomarkers that aim at quantifying HBC antibodies, quantifying HPS and HPS antibody complexes, and quantifying the different ISO form of HBS antigens. So the main uh, new biomarkers developed are HPV correlated antigen, which is a composite biomarkers which detect both HPE antigen, HBC antigen, and the P22 protein. These markers has a good correlation with CCCDNA activity, but has a low sensitivity. And circulating HPV RNAs, which uh, quantification is based on RT-PCR, so has a potential to have a higher sensitivity and specificity, but still lack of standardization and the different, uh, the different uh, assays developed uh, now have different target and don't detect the same uh, variety of uh, circulating HPV RNA. So it's hard to really interpret the literature. So, but now uh, Primidata support correlation between these circulating HPV RNAs uh, with CCCDNA activity. And finally, you don't have to forget HPV and HDV sequencing because uh, growing literature show that genotype determination, characterization of several mutations and also characterization of splice variants of HPV and even HDV genome have a role in pathogenesis and response to treatment. So to conclude, HPV is yet the virus with the most markers, but still we want more biomarkers to stratify these stages and risk for complications, especially identify reactivation early, cirrhosis and uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. We want biomarkers to identify treatment response before and early during treatment. Also, we want to predict partial and functional cure and identify patients where we can stop treatment without bad flares. And also new biomarkers to follow new treatment therapy and especially to monitor CCCDNA eradication without uh, going through liver biopsies. And with that, I, I thank you for your attention. And I'll apologize because I didn't cite much of the biography, but it's been exponential during the last years. Thank you very much, Caroline. So 
as we are a bit tight on the schedule, we are going to continue with the uh, next presenter uh, with Dr. Ji San Yang, currently a resident at pediatrics uh, in pediatrics at Armand Trousseau Hospital in Paris um, at the APHP. So she's specialized in pediatric infectious disease and has conducted research about the management of bronchiolitis and the impact of precarity on tuberculosis management, management in children. She's also currently an NPH candidate at uh, Pasteur School and CNAM and participated to the TAPROM study during an internship at the Pasteur Institute in Cambodia uh, this year, actually. So Dr. Young, the floor is yours and you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, thank you for inviting me. Can you see my PowerPoint? No. Yes, we can we can hear you. Not very well, but we can hear you. Okay. So um, thank you for inviting me. I will um, uh, present you my work um, that I did with IPCC um, and Dr. Olivier Cesarel and Laura Ferrand. So it's entitled that simplified criteria to assess long-term antiviral treatment so, eligibility in chronic HPV infected pregnant women. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. The study. Yes. Uh, okay. Can you try to to speak maybe closer to the mic because we we are you, but not very clearly at all from the room. If you if you can try. Okay. Is it better now? Much better. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So. Um, as you may have already um, heard about the TEPROM study in Cambodia, uh, first it has uh, evaluated uh, an algorithm using ALT level and HPE antigen rapid diagnosis test to current to identify the women that were eligible to TDF uh, prophylactic treatment uh, to prevent mother to child transmission. And then they showed that with an immunoglobulin free strategy, uh, there was no HPV transmission when the TDF was initiated a month before labor, when it was associated to early vaccination at birth. So um, the next step of uh, this work was to um, evaluate the eligibility for long-term antiviral treatment. As the, AA, as the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease in 2018 um, stated that um, when the women were identified as HBS antigen positive during pregnancy, they should be linked for care um, to test if they needed the long-term antiviral therapy. Uh, but the diagnosis tools that are used um, in the criteria are HPV DNA, uh, transient elastography, that are poorly accessible in low and middle income countries. Uh, so we evaluated APASL guidelines, EASL guidelines, um, the AASLD guidelines, uh, the Cambodian guidelines, and the WHO guidelines um, to assess the liberty uh, to LTT among HPV infected pregnant women that were enrolled in the TEPROM study uh, from 2019 to 2020 uh, using those guidelines as a reference. And then we assessed the performances of simplified algorithms that were free from HPV DNA quantification and fibrosis evaluation to identify those that would be eligible to LTT, so long-term treatment, using the different international guidelines. So we did this uh, res a retrospective analysis of HPV-infected women um, using uh, the following criteria. So we did the TEPROM algorithm. So if the women were HPE antigen positive or if they had ALT levels superior to 40, um, the TREAT-B score that has already been evaluated in Vietnam and in Africa. Uh, so it uses antigen HPE positivity and ALT level, and women were eligible um, when the score was uh, superior or equal to two. And then we um, use also uh, the novel marker that was presented before the correlated antigen uh, with the rapid diagnosis test alone, but also with an ALT-based score. So um, like the TREAT-B score, if HBCR antigen was positive, there was one point and then there was ALT level and we put the threshold at two points. So um, we did, uh, we evaluated eligibility to LTT during the pregnancy using EASL and ASLD uh, guidelines. Um, APASL could not be used because we didn't have repeated ALT measurements at inclusion. 
And then at six months postpartum, we used uh, the three guidelines. And but only among uh, women that were not eligible to prophylactic treatments, because um, for those that were treated, uh, an external committee uh, decided whether or not to pursue treatments. So we calculated sensitivity, specificity, and ARUC for the different scores. For the transgender uh, elastography, it was evaluated in the TPROM study at week six postpartum, and we used its value as a proxy during pregnancy and at six months. So concerning the results at inclusion, if we compare those that were uh, treated um, uh, that had um, the prophylactic treatment and those that did not have the prophylactic treatment with no surprise because it was part of the eligibility criteria. Uh, there were more HBE antigen positive patients and they, uh, those that were treated had more, um, had higher HPV DNA quantification. They also had higher ALT level and the treat B score was higher. Uh, concerning the um, eligibility to LTT. Um, so um, for AASLD uh, and EASL, I can't see my screen anymore. So um, for the total, sorry, uh, population, uh, the eligibility was between eight and uh, 11. And when they were eligible to prophylactic treatment, it was between 20 and 24, so we're a fifth of them. And then when they were not uh, eligible to prophylactic treatment, it was between two and 5%. Concerning the performances of the simplified criteria during pregnancy, um, so, with the AASLD as a reference, um, the performance was quite good, uh, especially with the HPCR antigen score with ALT level. Um, so with an AROC at 0 0.9, the sensitivity was at 87.5, and the specificity was at 75.29%. Uh, um, the treat B score was good with an AROC at 0 0.88, and a sensitivity at uh, 80.70 and a specificity at 79.16. Concerning the EASL, the performance wasn't as good as um, uh, there were more, uh, the sensitivity wasn't, was lower uh, with 52% for treat B for instance, and 61% uh, with uh, the HBCR antigen level. So how do we explain these false negatives um, about uh, the high number of false neg negatives was because uh, there were HBE antigen negative women with ALT levels that were between one and twice uh, the upper limit normal and uh, HBV DNA quantification that was higher uh, than 3.3 log. And uh, they had a transient elastography which was superior to seven for ASLD and six for six uh, for the EASL guidelines as a reference. For EASL, uh, there was also the women that were um, more than 30 years old, HPE antigen positive, and with a high HPV DNA quantification. Uh, concerning eligibility um, at six months postpartum, so among those that did not have um, prophylactic treatments um, at six months postpartum, two to 6%, depending on uh, the different uh, guidelines were eligible to long-term treatment. So if we sum it up, uh, eligibility to LTT was about nine to 11% in the whole group. In the TDF eligible group, it was between 21 to 24%. And in the TDF ineligible group, it was between two to 5%. Um, the HPE antigen and ALT algorithm was um, initially developed to identify those that were HPE antigen negative, but had an elevated uh, HPV DNA quantification because of the pre-core mutations. And they are known as being the most, as, um, most at risk of significant fibrosis. Concerning the performances of the simplified criteria during pregnancy, 
um, it was cl quite close to um, the scores that were evaluated in Gambia, although uh, the sensitivity was lower than the study in Vietnam. Uh, the lower sensitivity was uh, related to low ALT levels, so it was between one and twice the upper limit normal, but a transient elastography ranging from six to eight. And those, uh, the women that were more than eight, uh, more than 30 years old with HVE antigen positivity. So uh, these simplified criteria could be used as a triage option to delay um, H, uh, the, those that are negative and focus on those that are po positive for um, these scores. And um, they would need more exams to improve the specificity that is a bit lower. So pregnancy is an opportunity to identify women that are eligible to long-term treatment. Uh, the liver disease ass assessment could be delayed for women that are not eligible to TDF prophylactic treatment. And um, the criteria would be used um, to focus on those positive um, to uh, do uh, a triage and um, use more exams to improve the specificity. And so there is also an urgent need to, stand, to uh, make uh, guidelines that are standardized internationally and that are accessible for low and middle income countries where the prevalence is the most important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Young. So we are going to, to continue with the next speaker and we'll take all the, the questions at the end of this session. The next speaker is Dr. Gonzague Jourdain, <clears throat> who is a medical doctor and a researcher and epidemiologist, and is conducting several research projects at Chiang Mai University and with Maidol University in Thailand, especially regarding clinical trial evaluating the efficacy of maternal course of tenofovir plus infant immunization without immunoglobulin to prevent infant HBV infections. So this trial will be completed soon. So his research interest is directed at facilitating and increasing access to HIV, syphilis, and viral hepatitis testing as an entry point for prevention and treatment. He has authored or co-authored about 150 publications in international journals. And uh, Gonzague is also a pillar among the scientific committee of this uh, symposium. And I would like to, to thank him warmly uh, for all the work he's done since the, the beginning. So, Gonzague, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, would it be possible to stop the sharing of the screen so, to Dr. Ji Sang Yang? Are you still here? Dr. Yang? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. So, Gonzague, the floor is yours. Thank you for your introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, I will talk about uh, the prevention of perinatal transmission of HBV. And uh, first, uh, give uh, my disclosures. So the world is divided, as you know, but divided between people who have been successfully immunized by HB vaccine, and maybe it's more than 50% today, but 85% of infants born in 2019 uh, were uh, immunized which is very good compared to about 30% 20 years ago. And then there are people who have been infected and continue to live with residual infections. There are probably uh, something below 10%, but it's not clear. And then when we talk about HBV infection, actually, hepatitis B, we are talking about people who have chronic infections 
and they are about 300 million. So preventing HBV is important because it cannot be cured. Huh? We know that. HBV is transmitted through uh, body fluids, but not through breast milk, very likely. There is a universal exposure to HBV, especially in countries with high prevalence because many people are, are possibly transmitting the virus, but also for newborns whose mother, father, or siblings are infected. And perinatal acquisition of HBV can occur in utero, intrapartum, and during early life. Okay. So we need to keep in mind that before immunization, any newborn is susceptible to HBV infection. Exposure to HBV is universal, so WHO recommends universal immunizations of all newborns, regardless of the, the status of their mothers. Uh, babies who are born to uninfected mothers will be exposed, they need to be protected. So it's a race we need to immunize before the infection. But not all infants are born equal. You know that also, but for HBV, high maternal viral load is a major risk factor. And we can measure it with HBV DNA load, but it's expensive and it's not available everywhere. So we have a marker, which is not perfect, is HB antigen. When it's positive, we know that most likely the viral load is high. We need to know also that it's very likely that HB antigen that is transmitted from mothers with HB is transmitted to the fetus and will persist for about six months to one year. And this may facilitate infection of the baby if not immunized. Uh, even several months after birth. So HBV, uh, sorry, <laughs> HBG, so immune globulin plus vaccine is, is very good prophylaxis. Immune globulin to infants may protect against the infection before the vaccine is active, because actually when you vaccinate someone, you know that uh, in the following hour, the person is not protected. It takes some time for the immune system to react. So it's not perfect. A vaccine, although it's good, it's not perfect. And studies have shown that we have still 2 to 12% infections in infants who are born to a mother with high viral load. They are escape mutants. We have found these escape mutants in infected newborns despite vaccine and HBIG. There are also still some uncertainties about the safety of all human blood derivatives. And HBIG is produced from donors. And to illustrate that, I found that last year, the US FDA approved a new product from Grifols, a big, producer, a big manufacturer of uh, immune globulin, with labeling saying that they remove the prions. And you know, now it's old story, but we had a big problem 25 years ago with prions. And then the major problem maybe is also HBIG is costly, needs cold chain, 
and the short, uh, the short, the, the safe life is short. So WHO reviewed the, the, the guidelines for PMTCT in 2020, and uh, they say we should use antivirals in the mother to help decrease the risk of transmission. It's very likely, but we need to remember that's not an alternative to HBIG because HBIG, when you inject it to a baby, it will protect the baby almost immediately, not as the vaccine, and for about two months. So you have time to give the vaccine and the vaccine will be efficient before the immune globulin disappear. But the uh, tenofovir will never do that. When the mother stops the treatment and because she delivers, there is no protection for the baby. So this is the, the idea. Huh? You give antiviral to mothers, the viral load decrease, and at time of delivery, the risk of transmission is very low. So you have potentially time to immunize the baby. So, but well, now there are several studies that are, have been completed and some still ongoing about this problem. The, the first one was the study from the, the team of Olivier Segeral in Cambodia. Um, they showed that actually, if you don't have the viral load available, cannot measure it, you can also use, in addition to HBE antigen, the ALT level. And they have noticed that women who have HBE antigen negative plus ALT more than 40, they may have a high viral load, not all. So it helps increase the coverage. The problem is that some women, as you can see on their figure, have ALT more than 40, HB negative, but they don't have a high viral load. So you treat these women, although uh, they should not be treated. It's not useful to treat them. Okay. And then they uh, completed their study with women who have HB antigen positive, but also women, because they changed the protocol during the, the study, also HB antigen negative with ALT more than 40, and all these women receive TDF. So you see here the, the rate of transmission or the rate of infection at six months in the infants was 1.5, but actually since they were very likely some women with low uh, viral load, the denominator should be a little bit different it might be up to 2% transmission. So basically, it means that the new recommendation of WHO in Asia, for Asia, are not perfect. If we believe this study, we will still have some transmission. But we need to look in details on how the babies were infected and when. So there, will, there is a need for more studies, virological studies. And then there are two ongoing studies, one in China at least, and one in Thailand that uh, we are performing now. What about uh, another tool? Is that you know all that there is a new form available for tenofovir, is tenofovir alafenamid. And we expect that it's better because it's more potent better pharmacokinetics, etc. We don't know actually the long-term tolerance, especially for the child, but there are two studies who were published in 2021 and 22 uh, 
where it's, it looks okay. But for tolerance, you need much more infants exposed to the drugs because when you see no defect in children, even in the control arm, it means that your sample size is much too small to see something. Bon, but what we could uh, improve probably is to test first all pregnant women for HBV, but also for HIV and syphilis, and why not for HCV, especially in countries as in Asia, where HIV prevalence is far from being uh, null, although in young pregnant women, it's more unlikely to find HCV. And if no one should be left behind, all women should be tested everywhere, even in small health facilities, even at 200 kilometers from uh, Vincennes. We have learned with the COVID pandemic, but actually it's possible to produce, to massively produce rapid tests for COVID. So at very low cost. And now it's less than one dollar in the 7-Eleven in Thailand. So why not? use rapid test everywhere where it's needed huh? because there is no equipment required and for example there is today it exists but it's not yet approved a test that can uh, look at four diseases hiv hepatitis b on the left uh, treponema so it's syphilis and hiv with two drops of blood. It's very convenient. And another thing that we can do is to streamline the testing process. And we have computers today. We have the capacity to develop programs to make it easy to self-test even uh, people under supervision. It's what we do in this program, Napnung, in Thailand. It's for, it's for young adults, not only for pregnant women. It saves the time of healthcare workers. Healthcare workers should not spend their time testing women. They can do it themselves. Most of them are able to do it themselves. They know how to use a telephone. It's easy to follow the, guide, the, the, the instruction on the tablet, it standardizes the process so we don't forget, we don't make mistakes. The data are collected automatically and so we can decrease associated cost. And there is an important project that will start at the beginning of next year with the, Merieux, enfin the, the Center for Infectiology, Lao Merieu, here. And I think it's very good news. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzague. So in order to, to save the time, we're going to continue with Dr. Uh, Pilavan Sibunlang, uh, who is a medical doctor and a research assistant responsible for routine hepatitis activities including HBV and HCV virus at the Center of Insurology, Lao Christophe Marius since 2013. So she recently defended in October 22, a PhD thesis about hepatitis B virus and immunity in Laos and the impact of universal immunization, a research project that was conducted in collaboration between the CILM, Fondation Marius, the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development and the Institut Pasteur in Paris. So congratulations, Pilavan, for your PhD. And uh, the floor is yours, and you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Babang, for your introduction. So uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. 
uh, I am going to present you our research publication with this entitled Estimating the Burden of Hepatitis B Virus Infection uh, in Laos between 2020 and 2021 across six zero prevalent surveys. Uh, in collaboration between our center and IRD, we did the largest epidemiological study on hepatitis B through the use of rapid diagnostic tests ever conduct in Laos. So thanks to generosity of the Miriam Foundation. First, let's talk about the epidemiological context of hepatitis B in Laos. In the years 80, estimate of hepatitis B in Laos came from infectious disease screening among migrants in USA. Uh, HSPS antigen positive rate is very high, 13%. This data indicate that chronic hepatitis B uh, was and still a serious health problem in Laos. So uh, Laos is therefore generally considered to be a high endemic country, more than 8% of persistent hepatitis B virus infection, particularly in the adult population. And in the absence of uh, appropriate antiviral treatment, severe liver cirrhosis or liver cancer, liver cancer that ranging Laos third on the world. And the routine vaccination of newborn attain hepatitis B in Laos was implemented two decades ago. Based on the past survey in our country indicated that only 34% of newborn were covered by the in 2011. Why is worse ranging between 58% uh, and 66%? in 2020, and the hepatitis B bird dose coverage was 83%. However, even the imperfect vaccination state that the research found that they has a much lower uh, HBS prevalent in children than mother, 1% uh, versus 7%. In addition, zero, uh, zero called evidence of zero protection is already detected among all the school children or young students, both in capital and in provinces. So based on many cellular survey conduct over the past decades, the situation of chronic hepatitis B infection is still particularly characteristic, uh, characteristic in Laos and unexpected results suggest zero uh, graphical difference in hepatitis B surface antigen uh, prevalence are observed. That the reason why we interested to conduct this research. So uh, objective of our study are to determine the status of hepatitis B in country with uh, weaker rapid test for qualitative detection of HPS antigen and to provide the information to authority for hepatitis B control strategy. Our work targeted five different population groups. The largest population is broad donor, uh, followed by hospital based, mostly focused on maternity departments, and then uh, HIV infection, patient cohort follow up in our center. Uh, that correspond to one half of the total estimated population of uh, HIV carrier in the country. And a medical student, Siri from the University of Health Science in Vientiane, and a small Siri from outpatient referred to our center in Vientiane for the first time hepatitis B diagnosis. Uh, Broad donor were sampled in eight provinces in Laos, while the hospital-based survey conduct in, in 10, uh, we conduct in 10 regions, uh, three in the north, five in the center, and 
two in the south part of country. And HIV infection, HIV infection, patients were coming from eight different HIV care centers in the country. Uh, this figure is HBS antigen prevalent in the different subset of participants. This one and this one is the hospital based survey. We observed that it's trend to be decreased in rather older than uh, seven to 20 years of age. Uh, and we observed overall prevalence 6.4% uh, and 8% in hospital based series uh, and the HIV infection cohort. The hospital based series were significant different in HBS antigen prevalence. Mother attend, uh, attending antenatal clinic or obstetrical department are uh, healthier on average than other uh, patients admit, admit to the hospital. According to HBS zero prevalence was 5% in attending mother, why is uh, reaches uh, 7.1 in children below uh, 15 years and 8% in the remind and adult participant. And we observed that male were systemic, systematically uh, lead more often infection than female. Men from the north were particularly affected by uh, hepatitis B. Sex difference were less uh, pronounced in center and in the south. The population between 20 to uh, 69 years success of patient. attend care at the hospital represent corresponding general population that did not benefit from the anti-hepatitis B immunization campaign implemented in the country. The mean HBS antigen prevalence can, uh, for women was uh, 5.6 and Y is worth 9.6 in the men. Cello prevalence in the hospital series was not so different from observed in HIV infection cohort. Uh, this slide is like a summary. Overall, one normalizes for the population structure and size in isolation according to our estimate. HBS antigen zero prevalence decreased along a north to south gradient for all age, ranging from 6.8 in the north to 5.3 in the central and in the south of Laos. The overall HBS antigen prevalent in Laos estimated to be 5.8 percent. So our study confirmed that HBS antigen prevalence among blood donor less than 20 years old, or we can call after implementation of vaccination program in Laos, was low 3.3 percent. Uh, comparing to the earlier survey of HBS antigen blood donor in Laos, at first time blood donor uh, between 7 to 20 observed at uh, 2.44 decrease from 8.5 to 3.3. And other hospital survey, the prevalence of HBS antigen was low, 2.8% in the same category age group. This observe suggests that the immunization policy from uh, for newborn implementation from 2001 has already borne fruit and reduced the burden of uh, hepatitis B in the youngest segment of the population. And then our uh, study also confirmed the existence of decrease uh, north to south gradient of uh, HBS antigen prevalence in Laos, the same as first uh, time uh, first time donor survey of Nuan Thong conducted between 2013 to 2015. Uh, 
uh, there are no well established explanation to the north uh, and the south decreasing gradient of his based on the equivalence in the country. Maybe uh, because of the original of ethnic in the northern of Lao, that uh, part of country such as Hmong, Mian, or uh, Tibeco Burman that describe for the long term as uh, affected by higher HBS antigen equivalent. Or maybe because of the Shendotai that characterizes separate in the mountain region, existing from northern India to, north, uh, to northern Vietnam, but most isolate uh, coming from south of China. It is commonly isolated in Laos as well. So in conclusion, after implementation of anti hbv uh, vaccination program, our result considered that Laos might be no longer a country highly enemic for chronic uh, infection for, of, uh, with hepatitis B, but rather than might be no uh, country with intermediate enemicity benefit from universal immunization. Also from the uh, demographic structure of Lao, such as last young immunized generation uh, versus short life expectancy. Uh, however, we are still far from WHO's target to reduct national HDS prevalent in children less than 0.1 in 2013. Therefore, that we need now is improving the vaccination coverage. And the, the key element that we can observe from experience from many countries in our region, how to increase the vaccination coverage is the repeated training, uh, keep a knowledge to healthcare worker in all level, particularly those who live close to village community. Healthcare worker will provide information to community and encourage population to come and get healthcare at the local facility. A second aspect is the communi communication between village and healthcare center. Overall, to improve our understanding of the factor or problem uh, facing hepatitis B control in Laos, we so far appear to have been successful Further studies should be conducted, including uh, continued exploration of the hepatitis B situation in the north of Laos, where the high prevalence than other. And the second implementation uh, and design prevalence study based on country age pyramid and on geographic distribution of the population is needed to generate a real estimate of HBS antigen in Laos. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pilaven. So we are uh, continuing uh, on our session on hepatitis B and our last speaker is Professor Christian Trepeau, who is an emeritus professor at uh, Lyon University teaching and the teaching hospital in France. Is the former chief of the hepatology department and director of the INSERM hepatitis research unit in Lyon. His research focuses on hepatitis viruses associated disease and their treatment. As a clinician, he has always been a passionate advocate for hepatitis treatment for all who need it all over the world and eagerly provided his expertise and teaching enthusiasm to promote treatment programs and refund guidelines. He has authored and co authored a high number of publications on viral hepatitis. And Christian has always been with us uh, for one of this event and with the Mayo Foundation. So it's a real pleasure for me to have him with us today for this uh, symposium. So Christian, please, the floor is yours and you have also 10 minutes as we are running already very late on the schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm missing to be with you and I wish that next year we be all together again. My talk today will have to take you from the actual situation of virus suppression to the new situation of uh, 
functional Q and 2-HBVQ. Actually, current treatment with nukes achieve virus suppression and disease control. And as you can see it, decreased inflammation is possible, even reversal of fibrosis is possible. However, progression to cirrhosis and HCC, as we will see, is not totally stopped. Indeed, HBS loss after five years is only 10%. And despite lifelong therapy, HCC remain and it's a major stumble. Actual therapy is associated with antiviral nukes that decline HBV DNA and normalize it, normalize ALT, but leave HBS antigen untouched. And this is what we aim at with functional Q, which purpose is to eradicate HBS antigen uh, and maintain undetectable DNA with normal transaminase. The barriers to functional cure of HBV are triple. And we have the HBS, which is the responsible, massive HBS is responsible for immune paralysis. And this impairs all the system of defense of, uh, against HBV and is responsible for defective immune response, both on B and T cells. Moreover, the biggest obstacle is persistence of CCC DNA with long half-life, continuous re replenishment, untouched by nukes. And this is the springboard for reactivation and relapse. Fortunately, emerging treatment targets for HBV are many. First, there are entry inhibitors with bilirubin, which is already licensed, but excretion inhibitors with NAPs, as we will come back to see it. We have nukes, we have capsid assembly inhibitors, we can target RNA to decrease HBS titers with siRNA antisense oligos. And even starting to target the CCC DNA. Furthermore, we can also attack the immune system. Innate immunity with tel like receptors agonists, TLR7 and 8 or adaptive immunity with checkpoint inhibitors, CAR T cell, and we'll see vaccine therapy. Let's look at now the results of combination trial of drug targeting the viral cycle. First, we have the drugs that we mentioned, nukes, CAM, and then we have to knock down antigen, HBS to lift the paralysis induced by a massive HBS. This is a key step. We can use siRNA antisense oligos for that purpose. On the left here, you have a, an example of combination of nuke and CAMs, and you can see they are synergistic, but this is mainly true for the E positive group, less for the others. On the right, you have nuke and siRNA, and you can see that there is a dose effect with growing efficacy reaching three logs of HBS drop. On this slide, we associate three different drugs, nuke, siRNA, and PEG interferon. This is a timeline, and what you can see here is the maximum benefit is obtained with at 24 weeks, and this inhibits four logs of HBS antigen, which is remarkable. Let's look now at the recombination trials of antivirals plus immune modulators. 
On the left, you have a replication cycle, again with the same panel of drug and bilevited. And then we have pickup immune stimulation targets, can be PEG interferon, TLR7, TLR8, but also checkpoint inhibitors. And recently, we can even consider using therapeutic vaccine. On this slide, I illustrate what I call the triple winning combination. We start with nukes, TDF. Then we add NAB, 48 weeks. Then we can come back with boosting with interferon, PEG interferon. On this business slide, I resume the benefit of this protocol, which block HBS production massively. On the upper panel here, you do have a drug regimen. Then here you have titers of HBS antigen, and here you have HLT. What you can see is that when you only use nukes, in black here, you can see HBS antigen titers are untouched. But as soon as you introduce NAP in white here, you can see a dramatic, spectacular decrease in green of HBS antigen reaching below the cutoff limit. At parallel, you have down here ALT flares. Altogether, the, this protocol knocked down HBS antigen to very low level. And when you, at this level, boost with, anti with interferon, you reach high level of anti-HBS. Altogether, we have a dramatic durable drop of HBS antigen. Functional cure is seen in 35% and the ALT flares are self-resolved and coincide with HBS clearance. Let's look now at a new type of protocol. And as you see here, this is a study which is just starting and we don't have results yet. The idea is to initiate with replication inhibition like nukes, then we should knock down to very low level antigen reduction to lift the paralysis induced by HBS. This can be achieved by SIRNA or, or ASO. And finally, we can stimulate the immune system with therapeutic vaccine. Altogether, viral suppression does control inflammation and fibrosis, but doesn't prevent enough HCC. Functional cure to restore HBS clearance and lift the paralysis is the next objective. Multiple identified targets do confirm the feasibility of HBV cure. And beyond inhibition of viral replication, which is the state actually, antigen reduction combined with immunomodulation are the key to success. And here, the drug discovery is fueling production of new antivirals, developing clinical studies, and all together, this will take us to the holy grail of true HBV cure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christian. So we've seen uh, through all the, the presentation, um, uh, regarding hepatitis B virus, uh, what has been done or to improve uh, what's remain to be done regarding the diagnostics, regarding the uh, tra transmission, the prevention of transmission of mother to child, um, or to improve the, the cure and also what is uh, uh, the burden in, uh, of hepatitis B in, uh, in now. So we will take very few questions as we are very late on the schedule. Uh, so, I don't know if there's any question in the room. Or if there's any question online that are maybe sent through the chat that I don't see, so I don't know.
So then if there's no, uh, there's one question uh, from Anthony Black to Pilavan. So we'll take this question and then we'll continue. Hi, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. Um, I had a very quick question for Pilavan on the fantastic study she did with the blood bank. Um, so we know that uh, blood donors, first time blood donors have a very, very different HBS antigen seroprevalence to repeat donors who have a much lower mm -hmm. seroprevalence. So my question is, when you looked at seroprevalence of HBS antigen in blood donors, was it just in the first time donors or was it looking at a mix of repeat and first time donors? The data that we have is uh, is not really the first time blood donor. Uh, we do like uh, estimate it. The we, we classify only the participant who less than twenty years old, and we mention this group uh, in the in the group that who already benefit from program vaccination, but it's not is not classified really the first time. Okay. Okay. I think, I mean, the reason I raised that point is because we see very clearly that first time donors is much, much higher. So when your data are being used to classify the country as a low or medium uh, seroprevalence for hepatitis B surface antigen, actually, it could be a quite a significant underestimate of the HBS yes, antigen. Yes, that we think is uh, your your participant is the is the participant who who are, who was who were born before program immunization. So uh, okay. uh, this, yeah. this this yeah. case that we think is different. Right. Okay. Just the last thing I'm going to say. It is not related to the vaccination. It's because they screen the blood donors. So if you're HBS antigen positive, the first time you come, then you're told not to come back. So if you're including repeat yes. donors, yes. then obviously, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah. Thank yes. you. May, may, maybe our participant is not very, very good classifier. yes. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much um, for these questions. Um, so I don't want to have the responsibility of taking all the time for hepatitis B and to not let any time to hepatitis C. And as I've been working a lot already, I will uh, transfer the responsibility of being the chair to Dr. Pimpa Paboribun, and we'll continue with the next session on hepatitis C. So thank you very much, Dr. Francois Sari Baba. Uh, to save time, so we will uh, we will continue to the second session on hepatitis C. Um, so to save time, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Nathalie, the second mayor, sorry for the <laughs> bad uh, pronunciation. So uh, Dr. Nathalie is a clinical epidemiologist and researcher currently working at the head of the clinical research group in the epidemiology and public health unit at Institute Pasteur de Cambodge. So uh, she has many, many experience on epidemiology, on infectious disease like a HIV, hepatitis, and recently on COVID-19. Um, COVID so uh, you have 10 minutes for your, for your title on progress toward uh, achieving the elimination of hepatitis C in the Southeast Asia region. Please, Dr. Natalie. Thank you so much, Dr. Pimpa. And uh, I would like to thank you, my former colleague and friends at the Marie Foundation to invite me to present this afternoon. Uh, globally, an estimated 58 million people have chronic hepatitis C virus infection with about 1.5 million new infections occurring per year. The WHO estimated that in uh, 2019, approximately 290,000 people died from hepatitis C. 
And an estimated 21% of the 58 million with chronic hepatitis C knew their diagnosis and of those diagnosed with chronic HCV infection, around 62% percent, percent, uh, of percent of person have been treated with GAA by the end of 2019. What about Southeast Asia? Data from 2019 to 2020 show a prevalence of hepatitis infection among the general population of about 0.5%. Among those living with hepatitis C, in, uh, uh, it's about uh, 10 million people. The, uh, the number of incident cases of hepatitis C are about 230,000. And uh, in this region, people dying from uh, hepatitis C infections, about 38,000. Uh, a recent paper, a systematic review paper published uh, very recently that including a lot of uh, studies uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, show a weighted pool uh, on a zero prevalence anti-HCV uh, of 0.84% uh, in low risk population. But as you can see on this slide, uh, uh, this uh, prevalence uh, increased a lot uh, with high risk population of people living with HIV of 30%, of in people who inject drugs of 51%, in people on maintenance dialysis 25%, and in the population of men having sex with men of 11%. So the WHO has set up an agenda for hepatitis C elimination and uh, by, uh, by uh, 2030. The effectiveness of treatment of hepatitis C with direct acting antiviral offer the prospect of positioning treatment for the elimination of HCV. Uh, what uh, is included in this agenda of uh, elimination of hepatitis C by uh, 2030. The target uh, are uh, reduce the new hepatitis C virus infection by 80% and reduce the number of HCV related deaths by 65%. And also the target to increase hepatitis C diagnosis for 20, from 20 to 90% and also uh, increase the number of eligible people receiving HCV treatment from less than 5% to 80%. What is the current state of cascade of care? So in 2016, Asia countries endorsed action plan for reaching viral hepatitis elimination targets set in this uh, global health sector strategy for viral hepatitis. Uh, from a paper published uh, in 2022 uh, about a model of disease burden and the construction of the cascade of care in Asia and Pacific region, the HCV prevalence declined from 0.64% to 0.58% between 2015 and 2020. The HCV incidence declined also by 6%. But the hepatocellular carcinoma incident for HCV increased by 7%, and the mortality attributable to HCV plateaued. There is a large, uh, uh, there are large gaps uh, in terms of testing and treatment that remain, because only 21% of chronic HCV infection uh, cases were diagnosed and 11% treated. This is a, a slide showing data from the WHO uh, in 2019. As you could see in the Southeast uh, East Asia region, uh, the percentage of uh, people with hepatitis uh, C were infected. 7% uh, were diagnosed at the end of 2019. And 5% uh, uh, of those who were infected by HCV were treated at the end of 2019. What about uh, people living with HIV in the uh, Asia Pacific region? Few studies to date are available on the diagnostic treatment and cure rate for viral hepatitis among people living uh, with HIV in this area. A big uh, study named the Treat Asia HIV Observational Database Low Intensity Transfer Cohort on people who are on ART and who have a follow up from 2010 to 2019 were included in that study. 
uh, patients were determined as positive for HCV for infection if they were ever tested positive for anti-HCV antibody, uh, HCV antibodies. So yeah, the results show that 37% had anti-HCV testing, of whom 10% tested positive. When we look at the hepatitis cascade of care among this uh, person with HIV, so 68% uh, of those with positive anti-HCV test has had HCV RNA test, of whom 51% had detectable HCV RNA. Among those with detectable HCV RNA, 65% initiated HCV treatment. And of the 40% who initiated HCV treatment, 90% which sustainable biological response. These are the W uh, coverage target for global HCV em elimination, uh, like Dr. Oisumi uh, showed uh, earlier in his presentation, uh, the goal from baseline to uh, the target of 2030, uh, notably for the number of hepatitis of uh, C infection per year uh, among uh, people who inject drugs per year. Uh, the my different milestone uh, in terms of number of countries with costed hepatitis elimination plan. In terms of surveillance, the number of countries reporting burden and cascade annually. And in terms of coverage, the number of needle and syringe distributed per, per person who inject drugs, and also the percentage of people living with hepatitis diagnosed and cured. Uh, this uh, shows you the gap analysis of progress in uh, hepatitis prevention, uh, testing, and treatment in Southeast Asia in uh, 2020. Uh, only 6.1% of the estimated population of 11 million with hepatitis C knew their status, and 23% of those had received treatment by end of uh, 2018. Uh, we know for, from a recent uh, publication that removing the transmission risk associated with injection drug use could prevent 43% of incident HCV infection globally from 2018 to 2030. Uh, these are an estimate from the unit about HCV prevention and arm reduction services for, for people who, are, who inject drugs. So uh, the different countries uh, are listed uh, on the left. Uh, different countries from the uh, Asia-Pacific region, and the percent of people who inject drugs reporting using steroid equipment last time they injected. Uh, you could see the, uh, uh, the percent uh, go from uh, about 80 to uh, 96 percent. And for the percent uh, of people who inject drugs receiving opioid substitution therapy, only one uh, country show uh, a good coverage uh, that is above the unit uh, target. What about the number of needles per person who inject drugs? Uh, you could see on this slide that, that uh, there is a huge difference uh, in terms of needles per person who inject drugs uh, according to the different countries shown here. And also in terms of uh, hepatitis treatment uh, financing in the WHO Western Pacific region by uh, 2020, you could see that some of the country, notably uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, the hepatitis C treatment by direct acting drugs are out of pocket and uh, not financed. Also, uh, a paper uh, also published uh, with the help of uh, Clinton Health Association uh, Foundation show uh, the public sector product procurement pricing for quality assurance product for in-country distributor as uh, December 2019. In terms of uh, diagnostic of uh, rapid uh, diagnosis test, uh, you could see that the rapid tests are uh, between uh, the cost is, is pretty low between uh, 30 cents to uh, $1, even 
a bit higher in 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 African countries. Uh, what about the viral load test? Uh, you could see a huge uh, difference between the price uh, uh, according to the different uh, uh, countries uh, from uh, $6 uh, to uh, uh, $30. And uh, about the treatment, uh, you also could see a huge uh, difference uh, between the, uh, the treatment. Uh, here in Cambodia, it's about $240. Uh, and you could see uh, in, in some country like Rwanda, it's uh, $60 uh, for 12 weeks treatment. Uh, the, the, there are new recommendations uh, from WHO uh, on simplified service delivery for the public health approach to HIV testing, care, and treatment uh, through decentralization, uh, integration, and task sharing, and use of point of care HCV viral load essay and reflex load test. Um, So in summary, uh, limiting HCV in Asia by 2030, the pro progress has been made. Uh, notably, nat national action plan have been developed in many countries. There is a significant price reduction of drugs and hepatitis treatment uh, is covered by uh, uh, some health insurance and government funding. Uh, what are the gaps? There is a slow progress in the arm uh, reduction. The funding for viral hepatitis, as you know, remains inadequate. The prices also of commodities vary across countries. There is also a slow progress uh, in scaling up access to hepatitis diagnosis and treatment and mortality has not yet declined. Although uh, there, are, there, is, uh, also a weak, uh, there are also weak data system uh, in the countries and there, need, there is a need to develop a monitoring and evaluation system. What, uh, in terms of opportunities, uh, uh, the, uh, there is a global fund insisted uh, about uh, the integration of uh, for, for the new uh, global health funding, the uh, integration of HCV care with other program, uh, notably HIV program. Also, uh, there is an opportunity for emphasis on decentralization and task shifting that has been shown notably with uh, different programs set up by the Clinton Health Access Initiative. And also uh, opportunities of collaboration with communities and partners, including the private sector. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Dr. Nathalie, to share us about the situation of hepatitis C in South Asia and show you about uh, the challenge. Is this uh, maybe uh, it's the same uh, country in the region? So now we will move to the Laos. Uh, how is the situation in Laos? So I would like to invite Dr. Anthony Black, our main partner that we have working on about that since uh, many years ago. So today, Dr. Anthony Black uh, will introduce or present you a study for hepatitis C in Saravan province that I already talked a little bit uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Anthony Black is the head of the um, um, a vaccine prevalent disease laboratory at the Pasteur, uh, Pasteur Institute de Laos since many years ago. So uh, please, Dr. Anthony, and you have 10 minutes uh, for your talk, please. Okay, thank you, Pimper, and uh, thank you for the invitation to um, present our data today. I'll be talking about um, two studies looking at hepatitis C in Saravan. As um, Pilavan actually mentioned this study earlier, um, in 2007, uh, Prapan Jutavijitam from Chiang Mai did a study with the blood bank, which included looking at hepatitis C antibodies, so in other words, exposure to hepatitis C uh, nationwide, and they found less than 2% antibodies in blood donors in Laos. Um, since then, uh, we at Pasteur have done a few studies looking at uh, antibodies against hepatitis C in different subpopulations in Laos, um, such as children 
healthcare workers and female garment factory workers. And in general, we found similar results, i.e. less than four, five, less than 4% um, exposure in these populations. So the two studies that I'm going to talk about in Saravan came as a huge shock to us. And um, I'll, I'll talk firstly about a study that was from 2017 to 2019 in Saravan. So Saravan is a rural province in the south of the country. It borders Vietnam to the east and uh, Thailand to the west. And it has uh, very low health indicators, including uh, vaccination coverage. So the study, the first study was a hospital based study in the provincial hospital and three district hospitals. And actually, the reason we set up this study was to look for vaccine preventable infectious diseases. So I, I'm not going to mention those data today, but we also included hepatitis C um, in this hospital based study. We recruited participants of um, age five upwards in inpatients and outpatients department. And for the hepatitis C part of the study, we looked at 753 participants, aged from five all the way up to 90 years of age. So we looked for anti HCV antibodies um, by rapid test and ELISA. And we confirmed um, viral status by PCR and also sequencing. So I'll, I'll go through this very briefly. Um, as I say, what we found really surprised and shocked us. So um, the seroprevalence of anti-HCV was 11% overall. And we saw this gradient from west to east and I'm not sure if you can see, but the most easterly district is Samoy district, where the overall seroprevalence was 24.4%. So this is bordering with Vietnam. Um, all of the, so 50% of the antibody positives were PCR positive, and they were all genotype six. If we look at this district in more detail, it's even more alarming. So, you know, I mean, in some of the age groups, we're getting up to 60% antibody positive. So this is really uh, a sort of unprecedented situation. Um, obviously, this begs the question, what's going on in Saravan? What's going on in Samoy district? What are the risk factors? What are the risk practices? So um, the second study which I'll talk about was the study which we did earlier this year in collaboration with Miria and Pimpa uh, took a central part in this study. And this was where we went back to Samoy district to ask what are the risk practices in this district. So we selected um, 24 of the villages where in the first study we, we detected antibody positive cases. So we're causing, calling cases those that are exposed. And we also selected age match controls. Um, uh, just very briefly to say, of course, um, this is an extremely remote area and they don't have any access to testing and let alone treatment. But um, thanks to PIMPA, we were um, very grateful to receive from Aid Care China um, treatment for all of our RNA positive participants. Um, but just to move on to the, the data, so the participants were aged from 20 to 90. We, we selected those aged over 18, so from 20 to 90. And most participants were from a PACO ethnic group. So this ethnic group are um, the majority in the district and they're quite specific for this area, also to some extent in Vietnam. Um, about 40% were antibody positive and about 60% of those had ongoing infection. And as I said, they were provided with counselling, treatment and monitoring. So what were the risk practices in this population? 
Um, on this first table, I've highlighted tooth filing. So tooth filing, um, not tooth filling, tooth filing. So this ethnic group in the past used to practice filing down their teeth with completely non-sterile, either bamboo or metal files. There's blood involved. It's a, a possible route of transmission of hepatitis C. It's not practiced anymore. Uh, at least not to any large extent, but it used to be practiced, especially in adolescence. So 9.5% of participants reported having their tooth filed. Perhaps um, more of an interesting factor here, 58% of other participants said that they'd received parenteral medication, so injected medication. And the majority of these, so 72.5% of them, said it was using metal or reused syringes. And this is obviously, um, historically, we know this can be a classic way of transmitting uh, hepatitis C across a, a large population. And this was reported both from non-licensed practitioners, but also the local health care facilities in the past. So a possible route of either introduction and or spread within the population. Tattooing, again, this is non-sterile. 33% of the population reported having been tattooed. Another possible route, I mean, it, it, couldn't be, it could be any of these or all of these are spread within the community. And the last slide on the risk practices, Many of the women, so 42% of all the participants had, piece, uh, had piercings, again, non-sterile and shared equipment. And the last um, risk practice, which was somewhat surprising, was accidental blood exposure. So this was reported by 37% of the participants. Um, and they, they gave explanations such as helping others who are involved in accidents. So, of course, being exposed to blood is a very high risk, um, and we weren't expecting it to be that, that high. Um, other sort of classic risk practices were reported to be low. So, um, no one reported men who have sex with men, 0%, low blood transfusions, and uh, Injected drug use was 0% reported as well. And just to say that uh, viral sequencing is ongoing. So viral sequencing could help us to determine the epidemiology of the infection and possibly the time frame of hepatitis C introduction. We suspect it was a long time in the past, but, but we don't know um, for certain. Um, this nice picture here, you'll see in the middle, there's uh, Pimpa and uh, she and uh, Nina here are giving information to the participants at the start of the study. So to summarize um, this kind of chance and very surprising and shocking data um, of high exposure in Samoy and also a number of risk practices in this area. Um, the recommendations, I mean, these fit in uh, to a large extent with um, what we heard from Dick, Dr. Izumi in the first presentation. So there needs to be uh, extensive community-based te testing treatments so decentralized. Um, we're talking about hepatitis C here, but of course it's possibly for other blood-borne infections, HIV, uh, Hep B, for example. The community and healthcare worker awareness needs to be raised. So in terms of transmission risk factors, how to prevent transmission and the importance of treatment and the disease consequences. And again, we're talking about Saravan here. We're talking about one district, but as we know, the disease won't respect the borders. So it could well be that there's an, a similar situation in neighboring provinces in Laos and maybe in Vietnam, because this ethnic group does actually cross between Laos and Vietnam. Oh, sorry. So um, 
the work was carried out by uh, Nina and Pimpa, especially in um, IPL and Maria. Um, and we had collaboration with Saravan Provincial Hospital, the District Hospital, and uh, the health volunteers. The sponsors of the study were Luxembourg uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, also the Maria Foundation, and OST, so the um, Aid Care China. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Anthony Black. So for the question, please give your question at the end of the session. So um, uh, the next speaker, I would like to invite Dr. Peng Chan Lekana from Cambodia. So she will talk about the validation of DBS specimen for the HCV RNA testing in Cambodia. Dr. Peng Chan Lakhana is the director of Godot Maya Laboratory in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. So she is a um, pharmacy and a graduate in pharmacy uh, university in Cambodia. And now she is specialized in degree pharmaceutical sciences from US. Uh, US uh, he is in, in Cambodia in 2013. So please, Dr. Lekana, and you have 10 minutes for your talk. Thank you so much for your introduction. Good afternoon, Professor, doctors, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I am so honored to participate in 2022 Mekong Hepatitis Symposium and to present to you one of our study entitled Validation of Dry Blood Spot or DBS Specimen for HCV RNA Testing in Cambodia. This study is the collaboration between University of Health Sciences of Cambodia and Medio Foundation. And the coordinator of the projects are from Medio Foundation, University of Health Sciences, ANOS, Pasteur Institute of Cambodia, and National Center for HIV AIDS, Dermatology, and STD Cambodia. This picture show the steps in current algorithm for HCV diagnosis. But what I would like to emphasize is that the initial testing to confirm diagnosis of chronic HCV infection is very important and is the key to the successful treatment. According to WHO recommendation for HCV testing strategy, HCV infection can be diagnosed in two steps. First is testing for antibody HCV by serological test to identify the people who have been infected. And second, if the test is positive, HCV on A or nucleic acid test is needed for confirm the chronic infection and the needs for the treatment. Also, WHO guidelines develop, development group stated that routine testing for HCV will likely be cost effective and should be considered. Therefore, the use of rapid diagnostic test was recommended uh, due to the simplicity, relatively low cost and rapid turnaround time. However, for HCV on air availability in resource limited setting is still a challenge and the limited operator inputs allows considering an implementation in decentralized healthcare setting. According to WHO, the use of dry blood spot or DBS specimen for test of HCV on A should be considered especially in the setting where there is the lack of access to laboratory facility for nucleic acid test or provision for timely delivery of specimen to a laboratory. DBS could represent an alternative to plasma to simplify and decentralize access to HCV RNA, especially at community level. Also, DBS could easily be transported to equip central laboratory where HCV RNA is performed. Looking at the situation in Cambodia, the prevalence of HCV infection in Cambodia among general population is 3 to 5%. Recently, a cross-sectional study conducted by University of Health Sciences showed that among people living with age 
uh, with HIV AIDS, the prevalence of positive HCV antibody was 6.8% and the prevalence of positive HCV RNA was 5.4% in different uh, areas such as Phnom Penh, Badong Bong, Siem Reap, and Sihanoukville. By year 2000, the HIV, uh, sorry, HCV transmission in Cambodia is mainly linked to the parenteral infusion, uh, the endoscopy, and the surgery. Therefore, the most at-risk population of HCV infection in Cambodia are people above 40 years old, where the prevalence can reach 10 to 15%. The serological tests are available in public and uh, private sector. However, the HCV RNA testing is very limited. Only few laboratories in Phnom Penh, and therefore only few patients with chronic infection are aware of their status. So we can say that systematic screening of HIV, uh, HCV infection is not available yet in the whole country. In 2018, National Center for HIV AIDS planned to screen and treat all adults with HIV and HCV co-infection. And in this program, HIV infected patients are treated using RDT for serology. And when the test is positive, they will be tested for HCV RNA using plasma. For this reason, our study has been conducted to evaluate the clinical performance of dry blood spot specimen for HCV RNA testing, comparing with the collected blood specimen among HIV, HCV co-infected patients coming from different provinces in Cambodia. To do this, we need to calculate the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, and to calculate the agreement of performance of DBS comparing to plasma. This is the workflow of our study, starting from AOT side where HCV RDT is performed and one blood in EDTH tube was collected and sent to Uncharted Lab. At Uncharted Lab, they collect DBS and they test plasmatic HCV on A using a bot. Then the DBS that they collected is sent to Rodolf Merrier Laboratory at UHS. We also received the dry blood spot from Pasteur Institute Lab where they perform HCV serology and plasmatic HCV on A using Roche. DBS. Uh, were uh, transported to Rodolf Major Laboratory where we tested for HCV on A using biocentric. So looking at the detailed workflow for screening HCV, we use SD BioLang HCV RDT. And when the test is positive, we will test secondary HCV on A test by using a real-time HCV assay at Uncharted Lab and plasmatic HCV on a Roche at IPC lab. At the same time, five spots of blood were collected and transported to Rodolf Major lab at UHS, where on a will be extracted from that DBS using illusion buffer and we use Kiom viral on a mini kit. The RNA will be tested for viral load HCV using biocentric omnis kit and we use a bioretomocycler. The result of viral load will be included in this table to calculate the parameter that we described earlier, such as prevalence, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, and Cohen kappa coefficient to evaluate of uh, agreement. So the result of viral load in our study are here. Uh, from Pasteur Institute, there are total uh, sample of plasma, uh, the, the number total number of plasma is 50 sample and among them 18 sample is positive for HCV RNA. From Uncharted Lab, there are total number of sample, uh, 30 plasma sample and among them H is positive positive for HCV on A. From Rodolf Major Lab, where we test only DBS sample, we receive in total 80 DBS and among them 23 is positive, which uh, 16 is from IPC, uh, Pasteur Institute of Cambodia and seven from Uncharted Lab. 
So we include this number into this table to calculate the parameter using the Excel sheet. And here is our result. We found that the prevalence of our study is 33% and the sensitivity of DBS is 84.62%, where the specificity of DBS is 98.15%. The positive predictive value is 95.75%. The negative predictive value is 92.83%. And the Cohen Kappa coefficient is 0 0.85 with accuracy or 93.68%. Based on this result, we can come to the conclusion of our study. So the sensitivity and the positive predictive value of DBS make us conclude that high performance of DBS can be achieved when we use it for HCV or NA testing and false positive outcome are minimized. Based on the specificity and negative predictive value, we can conclude that more than 90% of patients who do not have HCV on A will get negative results when we use DBS for HCV testing and for negative outcome are minimized. The value of Cohen Kappa's coefficient 0 0.85 make us conclude that almost perfect agreement between DBS and plasma is achieved. So, for our study, we can support the idea that DBS can be used for HCV on a testing, especially at limited resource setting. We would like to acknowledge these people for conducting this study and to make 2022 Mekong Hepatitis Symposium happen. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lakana. Very nice uh, presentation. So now the floor is open for the question and answer. Please, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand for the uh, online participant and for the room, uh, you can stand up and ask directly. Thank you. There's any questions? No, from the floor. So I have one question for Dr. Lekana. Uh, according to your result, it's very interesting. I was surprised. <laughs> and do you think that if we increase the, the number of samples, because you have only uh, less than 100 dBs, right? For testing, yeah. So uh, 80. If we increase the number of samples uh, until 200, for example, do you think that the sensitivity and the specificity will be changed? Yes, actually, what we expect to get is the prevalence of more than 60% to make a better conclusion on the sensitivity and specificity and so on. But uh, according to the uh, sample that we collected, uh, we cannot get as many positive samples as we wanted to. That's why we choose the population of HIV and HCV co-infected, where the prevalence can be uh, more than general people. But I really uh, support your idea that in the future, if we can increase the number of samples uh, to reach the prevalence uh, more than 60%, so uh, the value of sensitivity and specificity and other parameter is better than this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there Dr. Kongzak? <laughs> Please, Dr. Kongzak. Uh, it's a question for Anthony Black. I have heard that uh, two filling is also practiced in Bali. Do you know if there is a similar problem? That's a great question. I, I don't know, but I'm going to go and look. <laughs> I, I don't know, but um, yes, it, it, and it's probably practiced there now, whereas in, in Laos, it's, it's kind of stopped in that area. 
Uh, brilliant, brilliant question. I don't know. <laughs> so if there is no more questions, so I would like to now we finish the session uh, for hepatitis C challenge and opportunity to meet the 2030 is HCV eradication goal. So you see that is not really easy to catch up the goal. So now we are moving on the conclusion session. So I would like to invite Dr. Kongsak Jordan uh, to conclude and make some remarks on sustainable development goal. Please, Dr. Kongsak. Okay, I will be brief because we are a little bit uh, behind schedule. And um, the first thing is that I think we have learned several important things today. And uh, we are maybe closer to know what we need to know to reach the objectives of uh, the sustainable development goals. So in the most of the development goals related to health are in the third development goal, but actually all sustainable development goals are important to reach the health objectives because they are complementary to each other. And so we have, especially according to the, discussion, the, the, to the discussion we had, two sub uh, SDG. Uh, one is to end the epidemic of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases and combat hepatitis, etc., <laughs> uh, by 2030. And the other one, we are talking about that also, is to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive healthcare services. So, if we want to combat hepatitis, it's clear that we need more testing because the testing is the entry point for prevention and treatment. And this has been uh, shown by Anthony Black. If you don't test in a community, even if you have no clues about what happens there, you will never know that there is an epidemic of hepatitis C. It's true for most infectious diseases uh, like that. There are sophisticated diagnoses that we need for diagnosis uh, and also monitoring. Uh, but they are not always affordable, but they are solutions that are in development. And we see that in Cambodia, they have an original solution because uh, it could benefit to everybody. Uh, the problem is that our load is not accessible in remote area. So if you can send it by the post, uh, then you have solved the problem. Uh, for all these diseases, and we need testing, diagnosis, monitoring, and treatment. So Monitoring is also important, but sometimes expensive. There will be solution. Treatment for HBV and for HCV exists, but they are not always accessible. We have seen that it depends on countries. There is no cure yet for HBV, but there is a very easy, easy cure for HCV today. And we have a lot of knowledge. So the question is, do we need just to use uh, what is available? Not exactly. We need, first of all, 
and it's our responsibility. Our responsibility as people who are involved in health, healthcare, research, etc. We are responsible to inform, to explain, to convince decision makers. Political willingness is a major factor. And then we need service delivery systems, clear objectives, which has, uh, is uh, greatly helped by the SDGs, simplify treatment guidelines because people are lost in the guidelines when it's complicated. And we have seen that we can treat more people for HCV if the guidelines are simple, right, with uh, very little things to do except taking the treatment. Training of healthcare workers with updates, information, education, participation of the communities, because it's the link between healthcare workers and the people who are sick or infected. We need supplies, infrastructure, and we need to evaluate, uh, monitor, evaluate, readjust, and maybe a dose of implementation science. The other, uh, the other uh, part of the SDG3 is access to sexual and reproductive healthcare services. It's definitely needed to prevent HBV uh, mother to child transmission. And it's crucial also, it's very simple, it's crucial to improve the health of mothers and infants. And the triple elimination goal, for example, should be used also to strengthen the healthcare systems. So many thanks to everybody and hopefully see you next year. So thank you for everyone. Uh, where is our MC? <laughs> So I will close this, uh, this meeting, um, this symposium. So again, uh, the, the symposium is very important. Um, there was one part this morning, which was the, the national one, uh, more focus on the, the Lao uh, treatment guidelines, on where we are, what to do, and the session of this afternoon, the mixed one, uh, which is the regional one, uh, with participants uh, being present here and online. So I would like to, again, to thank uh, the organizational committee uh, that has done a very good job to prepare it, to make it happen. It's a lot of work. It's only two hours online, but uh, it's much more hours to, to prepare it. So I will not um, uh, name everyone, but again, uh, a lot of, uh, of thanks. And uh, you can count on us at least the Mario Foundation to make it happen next year because as you have all seen, there's still a lot of work to do in the region. And uh, this is again, a public, a major public health uh, problem. And if we want to reach the goals uh, as uh, Gonzague showed us, we, we still have a lot of work. So thank you again. And I wish you a good end of the morning for people, for attendees in, uh, in Europe and a good end of the afternoon for people in the region. And uh, looking forward to see you soon.